So officially welcome everyone here in person and on the TV screen in front of me. You all can't see that, but I can see all of you. Welcome. And uh, just for setting kind of, um, I don't know, we'll have some quite a bit of nuts and boltsy things to go over today. One thing about uh, Zoom culture that we're trying to develop here at Budai Temple that if ever possible, and if you're willing to, we always prefer to see your face. So I know some people will be very clever and take a, a cute picture of themselves and just have that up the entire time. And that's fine if you want to go that route, but it's always nice to see you there listening and uh, know you're not sleeping. And so some of us may be uh, coming in person sometimes and online other times. And I sent everyone a link today to that. And we only have one link to our room here at Buddha Eye. So if you could find it through all sorts of other communications we've done, that's the one. And if you get stuck on any kind of uh, technical issues, feel free to email the temple. Right now, Joichi uh, is holding down the fort. Uh, he's our tech monk, our tech guru. So feel free to reach out if you need something. And then I guess I'll, I'll holster that. We have lots of nuts and boltsy stuff. So maybe a quick bio about who I am. So my name is Genjo Mark York. So grew up in Portland, uh, went to the university here and found Buddhism around that time. And so that was about 10 years ago and have been practicing here ever since. Uh, about four years ago, I was ordained by Ejo, the head teacher here, and uh, been training full time since then. A year of that time was spent in Japan at a couple different monasteries. And uh, right now, Ejo asked for five years of training in our kind of novitiate, like formation period. And so I'm in year four of that, and we're starting to plan for sort of my graduation ceremony, where I basically will go from an apprentice monk to kind of a journeyman monk. And that has its all of its own terminology and such. That's also the time when Ejo, uh, people might have heard rumors about this, but Ejo will be sort of a be the right word. He's officially installed as the abbot of the temple. So right now he's been acting as head priest and essentially the abbot for, I don't know, since this place has been going 17, 18 years or so. But that's it's a really important um, stage in his uh, life as a spiritual leader, you could say, and also for the community. It means we're kind of going into the next level of being a fully mature uh, practice temple. Mon monastery is another word, temple practice temple. So that's sort of where I am in the shoot and kind of what I'm up to. And part of that is uh, teaching classes. This is my first time up here doing kind of teacher fronted instruction. So very exciting. So and if you feel inspired, um, many of you I know and many of you I do not know. So please send me a little blurb, however much you want to say about your life. I'll definitely read it. I might give just a pithy response and say, great, thank you so much. Um, but if you want to share a little bit with me about kind of what is inspiring to you about Buddhism or why you came to this class, even if just you're my friend, you know, my father's actually here. I think he's less interested in Buddhism and more just interested in watching me. So if that's your, you know, whatever position you have, if that's great, feel free to share it. I'm happy to hear it. So my intention for this class, we usually try and run a foundational teaching series. Uh, we're running sort of introduction to meditation all the time here at the temple every Sunday. I've seen many of you in that space. Uh, but we also are trying to teach uh, sort of the background cosmos, the Buddhist cosmos of uh, what's going on with a human life, what's valuable, what's important, what is there to do, right? And that, that balances really nicely. I think as, as uh, maybe most Buddhists would have it, we'd say, do the, do the practice first. Read, read books later. Go and, go and uh, sort of directly encounter mind first and then sort of do practice later or do kind of study and uh, learning about the cosmos and history later. But we can have both. So isn't that great? We can do both at once. So uh, you can get really these kinds of teachings anywhere. There are fabulous resources. There's almost too, too many resources. I mean, Wiki, Wiki, the Wikipedia articles are pretty great. Um, there are several Buddhist groups that have just devoted themselves to translations and offering the teachings free of charge. Um, so, uh, further, my technical uh, understanding is not superb. 
<laughs> I'll admit that straight up. So I'm really interested in offering a good set of bones with a lot of flesh. That's what, that's what I think I can do. And further, I think I can offer my own um, inspiration. I feel it's really wonderful, you know, having been practicing here for 10 years and uh, as a young man, a little bit lost uh, when I first found this place. And uh, the kind of, uh, I met a teacher who's really wonderful and I met teachings uh, that gave my life real value and purpose. And really that's why I stand in front, I sit in front of you with a shaved head today. So uh, if I can offer you just an ounce of that kind of um, preciousness, that kind of uh, invitation into the mystery and also the order of uh, the beauty of a human life, I will feel very happy. So that's my intention for this class. And uh, this class isn't going to be offering much formal instruction about techniques, but really it's going to be a little bit more on theory, a little bit more on teachings. And so, uh, like I said before, these are really meant to go hand in hand with practice. There's uh, lots of, uh, what's the right word? Icona, there are all these stories in Zen teachings about there's this uh, scholar who has all this great wide knowledge of certain sutras and all the teachings and then they go and meet a Zen master or even a, a, a little old tea lady and they're totally duped, right, by someone who has cultivated a really intimate understanding that's not limited to just sort of technical know-how. And so I uh, really encourage you not to just grab onto these and be like, I got it, I got it, but to look to places that are saying, okay, now what do you do with these? What do you do? And if you want to know more on that, we're teaching Introduction to Meditation every Sunday morning. I'm running those a lot, so just email. More nuts and boltsy stuff. We're having everyone sign up for this class. There's no fee. You're welcome to make a donation if you want. It helps pay for the candles and keeps the lights on and offers me a stipend so I can be teaching and, and go get a beer with my friends and a tube of toothpaste once in a while, as my teacher says. Um, so feel free to donate if you feel inspired. It's not required for this class at all. And uh, if you haven't signed up for the class, you can come talk to me afterwards. We'll give, put a piece of paper in your hand. Uh, or if you're online, uh, Joichi can, can you do that? You, you can email the temple. So Joichi will put the uh, office email in there and we'll get you signed up. And this is nice to create some accountability. I know it's Tuesday night and people have busy lives. Many of you are coming on Zoom. The last thing you might want to do is go get on Zoom for this kind of a meeting. But you know, just psychologically, if you said I signed up, I'm going to do all of them, it can help get you to the computer, hit that Zoom link, and, and be here with all of us. And although it feels kind of like we're separate, I think we can try and hold each other in that, in that accountability. And also, you know, I might get sick, we might cancel class, and we'll have your email so we can uh, let you know if class is canceled for some reason or another. Further, um, I might email you additional materials. So I've have been having a lot of fun getting sucked into different wormholes of uh, Buddhist offerings about teachings and fun YouTube videos that I thought had nothing to do with Buddhism, but are this wonderful psychological insight into things that I'm going to be talking about. So my intention is to be sharing those with everyone. There's no understanding on my part that you will dive deeper into any of it. So it's just, it's just for you to look at and uh, dive into you if you feel inspired. So if that email goes straight into the trash, that's fine. That's fine. One other note on additional materials. Uh, we have this wonderful book on uh, sort of introduction to Buddhism, really from a Zen perspective, Zen Buddhism and Zen training, uh, by a teacher um, who passed away a couple of years ago by the name of Kyogen Carlson. He uh, was a, a teacher and mentor of Ejo's. After Ejo came back from Japan, he was interested in starting a temple, and he sort of wandered around for a bit asking for advice and all of the Zen teachers in the area, and we actually have quite a few up in Portland in particular, really took them, uh, took him under their sleeves and took care of him and nurtured him. And this man in particular uh, was really important for Ejo, and he happened to write this great little book called Zen Roots. So we went and had these little copies printed. So these are offered to everyone here. Uh, they cost the temple a little bit of money, and we're happy to 
um, pay for that, but they're about $6 per one. So if you feel inspired to make an offering, help cover those costs, that would be great. And so actually this uh, class series, all six classes, will uh, be not exactly what you will find here, but this will be great uh, relevant material. And I would say just a great overall introduction to Buddhism and particularly Zen, Zen practice. So, and also we have a PDF of that file, so I'll be emailing that to everyone. So you'll have a copy of that. And if you're in person, you can bug me about this. And if you really want a hard copy and you live not in Eugene, I would even like send one to you. So just email, just email. So maybe just a little bit more on Zoom and interweb stuff, and then we should start getting into the materials. Let's see. Oh, this class is going to be recorded and edited. So we'll probably pull out a couple of my ums and, and <laughs> I just will say, oh, that teaching was very bad. <laughs> We're just gonna slice that. Um, so those will be offered to the community and a great way to uh, receive those and other kind of teachings is we have a weekly digest, we call it. It, sounds, it goes out on Fridays. And uh, if you're not signed up for that, Joichi will put a link of some kind to get you signed up. Great. It's great having a tech monk around. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. So what else? Ah, actually, that's it. Any questions in kind of uh, getting things set for these next six weeks? Got the tech aspect. Everyone's wearing masks. That's good, except for me. Cynthia, do you have something? I have a question. Um, oh. as, since I can't see the, um, how many people are in attendance in person, um, is there an issue if people want to come in person or for COVID reasons are you already, what's the space available? Space looks good for, I'd say, another four people or so. Okay. Yeah, Great. yeah. Thank you. And also, you can, um, you can speak if you're on the computer. I don't know if anyone knew that. Uh, so you can, there's, we have uh, these monitors. So we have the monitor and we also have speakers. And so feel free, if you have something you need to say, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and jump in. Uh, okay, so, so when you go out with your friends to have a beer, do you wear your robes or do you dress like the rest of us? Oh, that's brutal, Cynthia. <laughs> right out of the gate. Mostly I'll dress like the rest of you. There were, so brief confessional, there were times at the monastery where there would be parties and there would be alcohol involved and there was always this really awkward moment where all the monks would be wearing their small robe, everyone kind of look around and take off this little robe and then we'd have the, and then we'd, we'd drink and be merry with each other. And it always felt, I don't know how I feel about it to this day, but it has a sweetness to it, it also obviously has some problems, but who am I, who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? Any other softball questions? <laughs> okay. I guess we'll dive right in. So I want to talk about what Buddhism really has to offer. So Buddhism, uh, since the beginning, has not been so interested in abstract concepts, uh, underlying principles that uh, are disconnected from lived experience and from the goal of salvation. The fancy term is soteriology, so something concerned with liberation and salvation, which most religions are, as you'd imagine. And so there's a nice little story that's really classically repeated, um, uh, which sets the stage for this kind of idea that uh, there's going to be a number of discussions about metaphysics in here, kind of like what is the landscape of life and what does that mean for how we interact with it. But that's always in service, and if uh, that's not clear, then I'm not doing my job, or the teachings aren't doing their job. That's in service of how to live a better, more grounded, more uh, joyful and uh, life. You know, it has to be. It has to be centered there. So go ahead and read this. It's just as if a man were wounded with an arrow, thickly smeared with poison. His friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives 
would provide him with a surgeon, and the man would say, I won't have this arrow removed until I know whether the man who wounded me was a noble warrior, a Brahmin, a merchant, or a worker. He would say, I won't have this arrow removed until I know the given name and clan name of the man who wounded me, until I know whether he was tall, medium, or short, until I know whether he was dark, ruddy brown, or golden colored, until I know his home village, town, or city, until I know whether the bow with which I was wounded was a long bow or a crossbow, until I know whether the bowstring with which I was wounded was fiber, bamboo, threads, sinew, hemp, or bark, until I know whether the shaft with which I was wounded was wild or cultivated. And it goes further, and classes is long, so we'll skip a little bit. In the same way, if anyone were to say, I will only live the holy life under the blessed one, if he declares to me the cosmos is eternal or that the cosmos is not eternal, the cosmos is finite, the cosmos is infinite, the soul is the same thing as the body, the soul is one thing and the body another. After the death of a Buddha, uh, they still exist, or after the death of a Buddha, they do not exist. And it goes on and on. And why are they undeclared by me? Because they are not connected with the goal, are not fundamental to the holy life, they do not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to calm, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, to nirvana. That's why they are left undeclared by me. So, uh, that's pretty clear. <laughs> the, it's not this, uh, this practice, this religion, these teachings, they're not concerned with an e empirical, externally verifiable, capital T, truth. Uh, rather, with personal exploration and liberation. So not merely theoretical, but also concerned with the practical. So really here, we're not uh, trying to pin down the world in a certain way that they can, we can know it from outside, but really, what's the landscape as it is when we are uh, faced with the difficulties of human life? And when we start to look at and realize that there's great uh, swaths of anxiety that we all tend to live in, whether we uh, are admitting it or not. And once we start to look there and attend to it, uh, we are concerned with the medicine to unlock that. And so, if ever I'm presenting things that just feel totally abstract and uh, disconnected from your personal experience, feel free to holler and ask clarifying questions. I think, as I mentioned, there's gonna be quite a bit of teacher-fronted uh, instruction by me. However, I'm hoping to make time at the end of class and at the beginning of classes for more discussion. So kind of in going forward, uh, let's say that sort of in the moment, please ask clarifying questions if you have them. So if something is kind of unclear, quick little, let's attend to that and make sure everyone has a good understanding there. Let's do that in the moment. And if you have kind of more probing questions, kind of more, uh, let's say, discussion questions, uh, we'll try and bracket those at the end of the beginning of class. So, let's talk about some pretty meta metaphysical concepts <laughs> that underlie really all of uh, Buddhist teaching. I'd say they're probably the two most fundamental things that set forth all the rest of the teaching that, that come from here. So first, where did I start? Is that somewhat visible? Can folks on the screen see that? Great. heard these terms? Are these, are these brand new to anyone? Yes. Oh, great. 
wonderful. Maybe the the Pali terms here, and the Buddha didn't actually speak in Pali, but it said that the the language that he did spoke was quite close to it, so kind of the closest to the words that were actually used at that time. I don't think they still know uh, much about that language. Um, they don't have reliable translations of it. What we do have is the Pali. So let's start with um, anicca or impermanence. So really, I think this is quite easy to understand conceptually, right? No thing, no state, no uh, circumstance, no shape in the world will ever stay the same, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. And the word often used in Buddhist terminology is phenomena. No perception of mind, no object in itself will ever, will ever stay put. So everything is in constant, constant flux. Uh, on an external level, we can see that pretty clearly, right? Everything breaks, everything's growing, everything's decaying all the time. We actually just had a, a little hunt here at the temple. Uh, we found some gouges in the temple floor and realized there were some rogue chairs without rubber feet on them, <laughs> putting nice big scratches in our beautiful floor. Uh, so just another aspect of impermanence, right? It's always kind of annoying to live in a Buddhist temple like that. <laughs> uh, our teacher here, Ejo, Ejo, has a story where uh, he would always bug his wife and say, everything's impermanent, everything that has a form will break. And then she, <laughs> she was washing his favorite cup and it fell and smashed. <laughs> she just looked over at him and said, everything that has a form. So uh, you have that to use against your loved ones. Uh, and so, on one level, really easy to get. On another level, to sort of think about the significance of that and what it means for a human heart, kind of another level. So I don't know about you, but when I think about that, it's a little bit trippy and, uh, what would be the right word, illuminating to realize how often I'm in pursuit of a static and controlled world. <laughs> I, I wish most of, I mean, I think, so much of my regular activity is designed to settle the world and put it at ease and kind of control it. I don't know how many of you live by uh, with a to-do list next to you. I'm trying to shake that habit, but it's not working very well. They keep finding me. But that nice feeling of when you cross off the last thing on your list, right? Ah, the world is in control. There are nothing, no loose ends. It's all, it's all settled. And that brings about in me, for at least a while, a nice temporary sense of ease, right? Ah, ease, settled. The idea of a vacation, even though it turns out many vacations are not uh, a plateau of bliss, right? And another place for me it comes across is eating an ice cream cone, right? Ah, smooth, easy, controlled. And that sense of uh, disconnecting with the complete, uh, what be the right word, fragility of everything as it comes across us in our life, right? We just slightly take a step back and say, aha, all, all settled. And I think the same thing is very true. You know, I was using all kind of positive, kind of going towards, uh, going towards things, vacation, to-do list, kind of control, but also in encountering very difficult things. So when uh, you've been at your job for a long time and someone gets hired who you're going to be working very closely with, and you really don't like this person. There's a sense that like, this is going to be bad forever, kind of have a singular quality to it. And that can give us a nice sense of control, right? We can have a, uh, a response that we can understand and know and kind of uh, usually inflict our idea upon that, <laughs> try, and, try and change the situation. Versus what would it be like to live um, much more connected to the comings and goings of all the nitty gritty pieces of that phenomena, right? To just settle and say, this is objectively bad. We, we have this dif distance versus like, oh, Bob has some qualities that, you know, are kind of charming. <laughs> Sometimes, now and again. Not all the time, but uh, there's more nuance. Life can be more like terrain rather than just, we can have a, a, an image of it, a snapshot that we can stay put and then point all our feelings at, right? I think everyone has an idea of this, kind of a common experience. 
And so even really difficult things, the loss of a loved one, disease, you know, these things are changing as we're undergoing them in the process of. And so if we think about this, we can start to see that there's a kind of discord that will sort of obviously be present in a human heart when it has the idea that uh, feelings, things, experiences will have uh, a static quality, something that'll stay fixed, and or something that could be attainable, right? Because it just won't be that way. After you have that ice cream cone, there's still things to do. You finish your, you finish your to-do list, there's more things. The room will get dirty again, our chairs will pop off their little rubber feet and, and gouge the floor again. So how much work, how, how exhausting is it to think that we can settle the world into a finite shape? And so conversely, we can start to think about how there can be a real ease at the center of your life when you have no expectation. I mean, we'll probably always have some kind of expectation that we can arrange our life a little bit, but if you start to massage that up, loosen it just a little bit by little bit, that um, we cannot stop the world. We cannot stop anything. We cannot possess a feeling or a shape. Uh, we can't have a kind of control we so wish we could have. And so this teaching of impermanence, really a, mo a modality of, of how we live, right? Born, born and die, born and die. And so thinking about this like a Buddhist, uh, we can in one sense pour out our energies to deny or obfuscate I like that word, obfuscate, to kind of like muddy up the waters and pretend we can't see it clearly, that everything's changing all the time. Or we can learn to accept this, to face it, to work with it, to live through it, um, and be intimate with that kind of changing. So about five years ago, before I became a monk, you know, I told my family, like, I'm going to take this dive. It's not a very lucrative path. It's kind of awkward. Um, most people won't really understand what I'm up to. And there was some concern, but overall support. And my brother and I were uh, coming back from spending time together. And I don't know if you've, for those of you who have siblings, things change when you like walk into your house with your sibling. <laughs> so we were deciding, oh, we're just going to keep hanging out in the car and enjoying each other in the space we have together. And he was curious. He was like, really wanting to get, what's, what's the juice? Why are, you, why are you going to become a monk? What are you trying to get at? What's the point? And uh, I told him, I was like, Scott, think, think about this. This guy, the Buddha, he, he knew himself completely as the flow. He was completely the flow. He had profound, unwavering connection with relentless change. In that place, nothing to gain, nothing to lose, no thing that could be attained, and from there, no thing that could be lost. And Scott, I just remember, he got this look in his eyes, and he was like, the Buddha is the flow. <laughs> and I was like, yes, brother, yes. And so I think we all have a sense of when uh, that place where you are... Um, you're in a place of touching rather than judging. And feeling and being changed by the world, even aware as we're changing it. And so these teachings can have uh, a, a beautiful side, that feeling of flow, that feeling of being one with change and not being averse to it. And on the other side, they can have a backside that it's good to talk about. But these teachings are not telling us that we need to just roll over to say if we're facing injustice, right? It doesn't mean just uh, give up our ideas for living a, val uh, a value-laden life and going towards conflict when that's, when that's necessary. Uh, rather, they're about that sense of not creating objects of our experience and dealing in objects, right? So we'll, we'll spend time later talking about how this is really actually impermanence and no self are really connected to Buddhist ethics, but right now we'll just we'll just bracket bracket that conversation. So, any clarifying questions? Here we are. All right. 
we'll keep, we're a little short on time, so let's just keep plowing away. So, anatta, here we are, no self, no self. So this is pointing at a similar concept to anicca, right? The, the lack, of, uh, lack of stability, in a sense. And really, well, um, which one is this? So this anicca, I'm sorry, anatta is more pointing towards the internal, whereas anicca is pointing towards the external. You can see anicca is also pointing towards uh, through time here. And this is in the physical realms of no self. That this becomes very clear through time, laid out in time. And this is more in the relationship of things, that things are always in flow. So for example, um, who would you be without the culture you were born in? <laughs> who would you be without your parents, your friends, your loved ones, that were all interrelated in this kind of way? And it's hard to, you can't find an unchanging center of anything, but everything's in constant relationship with each other. So it's funny that this, this teaching of no self is so central to Buddhism when there's another teaching uh, that's very central to Buddhism, which we've all heard about, which is karma, right? How can, there's something, right, rebirth. All the stories, the Dalai Lama, wonderful man, said to be reincarnated, right? So how do those, how do those square with each other? And so it's interesting, the Buddha actually remained quiet when directly asked uh, the question, is, is there a self or is there not a self? In, in his silence, he was basically saying, that's the wrong question. If I tell you there is one, you're going to get lost. If I tell you there's not one, you're going to get lost. So he remained silent. And further complicating things, uh, he said, if, if one is just thinking, I am, I am no self, I am no self, that that's um, delusion in another aspect of suffering. And further, he has this great quote, um, you, you yourself should reprove yourself, should examine yourself as a self-guarded monk with guarded self, mindful you dwell at ease. So there's some serious selfing going on in that situation. And so this teaching, it must be pointing to something else. And so to unpack that further, I'm gonna bug you with some questions. Who were you when you were 12, right? What were your concerns, interests, notable figures and powers in your life, your skills, your joys, your fears, and your goals? And so what will those things be when you'll turn 45 or when you were 45, you know, when you were 72 or are <laughs> or will be when you're six? in the womb, your very last breath, right? So it's easy to see that our identity is changing just vastly malleable, <laughs> depending on where we are in life, what's going on, what are the things that are important for us. There are innumerable energies, landscapes, and peoples, and objects which sort of define who we are. We can't find ourselves in another way. And then another example, a way to tease out this teaching of no self, and I quote this from Tani Sarubiku. That was a good little piece that I'll probably be sending to everyone later. Take an example from your childhood. Suppose you have a younger brother and someone down the street is threatening him. You want to protect him. At that moment, he is very much your brother. He belongs to you, so you will do whatever you can to protect him. And then suppose that you're victorious and you've brought him home safely. He begins to play with your doll and he won't give it back to you. Now, he's no longer your brother. He's the other. Your sense of self and what is yours and not yours has shifted. The boundary line between self and not self has changed. Right, it's a very simple example, but some, it's pointing at a profound way that we're living all the time, that my sense of what I am and who I have affinity with is shifting and moving all the time depending on our desires. And the Buddha says that the, the mind can take on more shapes and selves than all the creatures of the entire world. And so, like impermanence, we can come to know anatta or non-self, uh, that this teaching is about a fundamental principle 
that we routinely experience day after day after day. Our self, the self we view um, the entire world from and correspondingly act from, is moving all the time. The founder of this particular school of Buddhism has a nice little quote. He says, it's as though you're on a boat uh, watching the land and you're looking at the land and you're like, oh, it's, it's moving up and down. <laughs> the land is very unstable. And then you sort of realize, oh, I'm unstable. I'm on this boat. It's rocking all directions. And it looks like the land is moving, but actually I'm just moving. I'll read another quote by Tani Zarubuku that I enjoyed on this topic. Normally, we create our sense of self as a strategy for gaining happiness. Unfortunately, our desires tend to be confused and incoherent. We're also unskillful in our understanding of what happiness really is. Thus, we often end up with an inconsistent and misinformed collection of selves. You can see this clearly as you meditate. You find that the mind contains many different inner voices expressing many conflicting opinions as to what you should and should not be doing to be happy. I really don't need, I don't think you need to be meditating to, to feel that, right? It's, it's pretty apparent. And it's, it's, it's as if you have a committee inside the mind and the committee is rarely in order. That's because it's composed of cells you've collected from all your past strategies for trying to gain happiness. And these strategies often worked at cross purposes. Some of them seem to work at a time when your standards for happiness were crude, or you weren't really paying attention to the results you were getting, as when you threw a tantrum and got your mother to give you the food you wanted. These members of the committee tend to be diluted. Some of your strategies involve doing things you like to do, but actually led to suffering, as when you hit your sister and got your toy truck back. These members of the committee tend to be dishonest and deceitful deceitful. They deny the suffering that they caused. This is why your committee of selves is not an orderly gathering of saints. It's more like a corrupt city council. Does anyone know about um, split brain research? Has anyone heard of that? This is the fun part of being a psychology major. Um, there's a part of the brain called the corpus callosum. It's a thick band of neurons that connects the right and left brains. And they found that in uh, people who had severe epilepsy, they could greatly reduce the intensity of the seizures if they cut that. They gave it a snip. They said, we're not going to let these guys talk anymore. And I think they were a little bit like, uh-oh, let's see what happens. I don't think they really knew what was going to happen. They couldn't really see any observable difference, actually. There, people just seem to be totally fine. However, they did some interesting experiments. You can isolate which side of the brain you talk to. I sort of forget all the details about it. And particularly in people who happen to have developed language centers in both sides of the brain, which I think that's not always the case. Usually it's in the left only, but some people have it in both sides. They could talk to them separately. And there was one person, they, they asked the left side of the brain. I think it was a six-year-old boy. They said, what do you want to be when you grow up? The left side of the brain said a draftsman, which I had to look up. It's like uh, an architect, but you need less study. <laughs> and then they asked the right side, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it said a race car driver. <laughs> Isn't that wild? So, but, I mean, really, there are these multiple beings inside of us that are, uh, have different priorities, really. I mean, it's amazing how modern science is starting to look at this more and more. Another fun example I had, you're walking, uh, you're walking home with a friend and you're both really excited to eat these two brownies that are, that are upstairs and you get upstairs and there's only one brownie. <laughs> and so I don't know about you, but I'll often feel these kind of uh, ideas about how to go forward, these perspectives, these selves. And one is, dang, I want the last brownie, right? There's the one, usually the crudest of the lot. The second one is uh, something like, well, uh, I'm trying to lose some weight, <laughs> so I guess I could give it to my friend. Another one is, I really want my friend to feel this, this, this joy, this pleasure, so I, I want them to have it. So, right, there's this kind of jockeying inside of us all the time, and even it's so 
uh, amazing that we can be doing the same action, but really living uh, such a different kinds of selves and motivations uh, inside of us. And so through Buddhist practice and what these teachings I think are really pointing to is that we can learn to watch this amorphous selfing that we're really doing all the time. And we can start to notice that there's, there's a level of choice in what's going on. Our potential selves, which are completely linked to the world, uh, how we're viewing it and how we're trying to view or fulfill our desires, they're moving inside of us. Yeah. Hmm. And so what's, what's the point of all this? I think when we see that this me, this I, I am multiples and uh, start to investigate and tease out that I'm making choices, about the world and enacting different types of selves, that the question shifts from oftentimes a Western dialogue, that's something along the lines of, well, you have to find your authentic self, you know, find your, your true self. And I think a Buddhist perspective is more saying, where, where are the skillful selves? Moment to moment. So in each situation, what is the self you can employ at that time to really gain ease and stability, and which selves are pretty outdated in their ability to be helpful. <laughs> and how do we, at that time, when you're feeling like, man, I just want to eat the brownie, I want to hit my sister so I can get my toy back, uh, how do I holster that self? I really employ no self at that time and choose to employ a different way forward. And so this, in a sense, rather than finding you know, an authentic, unmovable, unchangeable, perfectly noble self? How do we start to investigate that malleability of self and start to slowly tease out what are, what are more skillful ways forward to live our life? Yeah. So, this impermanence of all phenomena of human life, whether out there as objects or in here, uh, is really a bedrock concept of Buddhism. And our ability to be in accord with this is really kind of the whole conundrum of human life, and I think in a Buddhist perspective. And in this book, Zen Roots, uh, Kyogen Carlson, he gives a really great example. Gravity is pretty universal, and but, and but, you can fall downstairs or you can walk downstairs. Both express gravity perfectly to the T, right? But it makes a big difference for human for human life. Yeah. I'll give one more quick little way to cap this off. There's, I read a retelling, it's actually in uh, something I'll send you, but a retelling of the Christian creation myth. You know, God created the world in seven days. And at some point he was talking to all the animals and he's like, great, y'all can choose whatever you wanna be. Whatever you wanna be, I'll do it. So pick wisely. Once you choose, you can't change back. And so, you know, the creatures that live underground are like, yes, yes, we'll live underground. And then the other one's like, well, I want to be able to hunt underground. So, you know, they got all these you know, claws and tools to be able to dig. And birds were like, oh, I want to be very fast and small and quick. And bigger birds were like, great, fine. I want to be able to hunt you well. And so the whole of creation was made. And then God got to man and was like, well, what do you want to do? And man was like, you know what? I'll stay kind of like soft bodied and you know, not really able to change or have any good skills, but I wanna be able to make tools. I wanna be able to change and move and shift. So if I want to be able to move across water, I wanna be able to build a boat. If I wanna be able to fly, I'll build a plane. And in this way, God was like, oh, nice one. You can have rain over all the animals. So, Without too much extension of that idea, we can think of this in a Buddhist sense that uh, every time we're choosing a self and holding on to it, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm this way, I'm not that way, uh, we're, limiting, we're limiting our ability to respond. We're, abil we're limiting our ability to be with the flow of life. And instead, in a Buddhist sense, if we're really paying attention to the impermanence of life, we're looking into and aware of the fact that None of myself stays still, and further, I only really, um, I can employ different selves. It doesn't mean that there's 
no self here, it means that there's great flexibility. And at that point, this becomes our ability to respond. This no self is a vehicle for reading the world moment by moment and taking a course of action uh, to be helpful and joy and really meet, meet other people. So I think that's what I have to offer tonight. We have five minutes left. I actually kind of hit it, hit it on the dot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So please, anyone have any, uh, any thoughts, any, any deep realizations they'd like to share with the group? People, feel, people online, feel free to unmute yourselves. Come on, there's got to be one, one thing floating around. Who is it? So the way I see it is everything changes and nothing remains the same. And how we react to it depends on which voice we're listening to. Yeah, I would say that's a big part of it. And how does that, Cindy, how do you think that relates with uh, your experience of meditation? I know. We had intro to meditation maybe a couple months ago now, and you're sitting. How does that tie in with what meditation has brought into your life? Well, you know, when I meditate, a lot of times, even though I'm trying to quiet the voices within, I've got this one voice out here that's like trying to take charge. But I've got those other little voices <clears throat> inside me that just keep sometimes just poking, <laughs> you know, and they, they won't let me have peace. Yeah. And so they're like these other little pieces of myself mm -hmm. that all together make up me. Mm -hmm. Is the committee getting less rascally or is, is the noise just feel like it's turning up? You know, it just depends on the day yeah. and how my day has been as to whether or not those, whether or not the committee is noisy or not. Mm -hmm. uh, when I did the deep intensive meditation a couple months ago that we did, the, the uh, one that we did for yeah. a week, yeah, yeah. Every, every evening. Yeah. The voices were quiet the first few nights, and the last night they were just like, I'm hurting, I'm not comfortable, mm -hmm. and they were noisier then, but at but the midweek they were pretty quiet when I meditated. Yeah, yeah. For me, Cindy, what something I find interesting in, in talking about meditation and those quiet voices and or loud voices, uh, I find that when I am merely attaching, just I'm, I'm just feeling voices, I notice that those voices almost always have a strong interest in uh, clamping down the world into their knowable perspective. And I notice that when I really turn on my energies and my awareness to say, okay, well, I'm just going to feel my breath. I'm going to let the colors like stream in in front of me. Uh, in another words, I would say, be tuning into impermanence. Like my breath and my, like the floorboards in front of me actually really defy narrative in a really great way. The body and the sensations, they're kind of, I find them to be an antidote to uh, the constant uh, trying to get the world in a shape that they like, or at least they can fight with, you know, if they can't get anything from it. And so, I don't know, that's a place where I find that these become really alive and talking with each other and having kind of productive dialogue, I'd say. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll give some quick optional homework. I know my father said, he said he'd only come to the class if I didn't give homework, but it's really easy. Uh, so throughout this next week, watch for a perception where you have set yourself on an object or experience which you are uh, driving toward. For me, uh, an example of that was, I learned it was Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> and my buddies and I were like, great, what an excuse to get together and have fun and eat guacamole. And uh, I sort of like had all these other, I should have been studying for this class better, so I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, I let that kind of be this driving force and it was actually such a total letdown. <laughs> and I think if I had listened to my better 
uh, my better judgment and not just sort of grabbed onto this shiny like, oh, food, fun, yeah. Um, I would have listened that there were many other voices there who were unhappy with the situation of uh, watching or trying to find worthwhile commercials, which there, I didn't think there really were any. Um, so that for me was a place where I noticed it's like, oh, I totally pigeonhole my being on this kind of experience uh, without really uh, investigating more deeply what was all there. And sort of, I got a rude awakening in the third quarter where we finally decided, let's play a game of chess that's way more exciting than this. <laughs> so. But we also love chess, so lots of things are not as exciting. So yeah, that's the homework. Curious, just find that spot where you're driving towards something and then question it and look at it. And then you can also watch the voices that might have a particular opinion about it find a contrary idea or a contrary opinion, and also take a moment and feel into your body, right? Something that is sort of without narrative. Look at a tree, you know? And just see, see how all that moves, and you can start to, this can just be a small way that you can start uh, discovering the depth that I think we so easily and naturally uh, avoid, that we have such vast, we have such a vast body but it's so easy to walk around with just a tiny little, tiny little view on the world and be forcing that image here and there. And it causes a lot of problems, in my opinion, and probably the Buddha's opinion, too. Yeah, Ciara. Um, I was going to ask, when you get those types of thoughts or ideas, is it better to notice it and to try to let it go or to really take note of it and pay attention to it? Does that make any sense? Totally. Can you say the two again? That there's the noticing yeah, there's, and letting um, go. Like um, noticing it and just trying to let it go almost immediately or like writing it down and taking note of it and trying to keep it in the back of your mind. Yeah. I think what's so great is that that cannot be answered abstractly. <laughs> that it, re it really depends on the voice and there can't be a ruler. Like, once you just try and be like, oh, did you check the marks of being important or not? Like, you know, basically, if I really want a cookie, it'll check all the marks. <laughs> but it should, it should oftentimes be one I'll just let go. Uh, but so it requires our real, like, uh, talking back a little bit, feeling into, like, actually being curious. I find that for me, one of the biggest challenges there is um, I will cut off very quickly without, without actually feeling. I'll be like, oh, I just know that is a bad idea or it's not a person I want to be or something like that. And without feeling how I actually have um, some urge, some life there, I'll just take a, take a sword and shoo, like, I don't need that. <laughs> That's not part of my identity. I don't want that to be there. But I don't know if any of you have a tendency to do that. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. In fact, it only gets stronger. It finds its way to ooze out or explode out into other parts of your life. Uh, versus a time where I'll, I'll more actually be like, okay, I don't, there's something unpleasant about that idea, that thought, um, but I'll talk to it, I'll hold it, I'll see it as valid in its own light, and uh, you go, go from there. But I think the, actually having honest inquiry, I think is, would be the most important thing I could offer. Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, I think that puts us even a little bit past time, Oh, wait, we're going to 8.30, aren't we? What time does this class end, Joey? I have no idea. 8.30. 8.30? Oh, hot dang. We got 15 minutes left. Uh, well, I guess we can continue with questions, and then I actually did have something I wanted to get to. Um, kind of introducing, getting us ready for next class, but we seem to have different trains of dialogue going, and anyone else want to jump in? Aaron. Oh. Maybe pause. Aaron's going to ask a question in person. And then is it Daniel? Are you up next? Yeah. Hi. It might be a clumsy way of asking it. Um, you started off tonight by talking about sort of the, I guess, your personal want for control um, and trying to sort of ease off of that. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you, I think I come from, the complete opposite 180 of that is mm. I, 
I don't want control over anything. And so mm-hmm. like impermanence speaks to me, but in a way that I'm not attaching to things that I would, in a way that I would like to, like I almost want to come mm-hmm. away from that, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm trying to frame that within yet everything is impermanent still. Oh, and so yeah. like, how do you bring attachment into something like that when you aren't starting there? Well, bud, I don't know if this will like put you on the spot at all, but what do you think is functional or what are you getting out of not attaching? Like how I'm wondering if that could also be a kind of control, right? If you know that oh, the moment, the moment you grab the bowl, right, it's going to, it's going to move and you're like, Oh, I don't want the, you know, that could be a way of just saying, Oh, I'm on the sidelines of life, you know? Yeah. No, I think it's a hundred percent. Like, I think I don't maybe have control over those feelings when I go there. So it's easier not to go there. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So can you you say your question again? I lost exactly. Well, it just feels, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting some understanding here of when you start attaching, here's how to go away from that. But I'm Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how do I, I don't know how to balance it, I guess, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, like, you know, what's coming to me right now is, in a way, I would say meditation for me, I would almost say, in a sense, is not, uh, you know, people might say, that's the place where you learn to let go. Um, But for me, it feels actually the exact opposite. It's the place where I realize that I'm totally, like, in the lion's jaws that all these little tendrils of my being that I'm like, mm, you know, uh, I, can, I, can, I can develop a narrative of life and just kind of like blast through a little bit. But when I sit down, I'll realize that all these things that I've left out have been talking and tugging at me in all sorts of ways. And so I wonder if, um, uh, have you found ways or places where you you go to or turn towards to uh, sort of realize that connection's already there. Not that you need to grasp, but that actually your hand is fused with the things you want to love. I don't know, I'm just kind of pulling out. Yeah, there. no, it's things to think about. Leave it there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Daniel? Something. Oh yeah, I didn't really have a question so much. I just wanted to uh, and my appreciation for uh, how you would illustrate the interrelationship between Nietzsche and Nanta. I really appreciated that. Mm-hmm. The way that you were describing how like they're kind of at least to me it seemed like they're saying like just they're kind of they have a relationship with each other, so they're not separate. Yeah. They're not like one is not arising from the other, they're kind of like to me as a visual like they're nested inside of each other. Mm. Which one was which? Um, initially, it's like, you know, Anisha seems like the self seems to come out of impermanence, but then it's like impermanence comes out of the perception. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, I, I appreciated that when you were describing how Anisha is like the perception through time, and then Anato is like the perception in relationship to things. I think for me, that really helps clarify like, how these are both. Descriptors of sensation of phenomena, and it's like neither one is a discrete thing. I have to tend to have to mind yeah. plus to grab onto concepts. Totally. So like, like having it described as like these things are flowing relationships with each other helps me relax that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The other word here that many people would have encountered before. And this is so awful, you guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Emptiness. Right, here's another one of these um, intensely nihilistic sounding concept. But actually, Daniel, these, these guys are basically the descriptors of this word we're hearing all the time in Buddhism, is that things are empty. You can't, and by that, it's just saying that there's no essential core we can find to anything. So right, a classic example, you hold up the piece of paper. This paper contains the entire universe. The sun, that helped make the trees. You know, I actually won't 
do that again to you because we've all heard it many times. And then a lovely quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Zen master. Uh, he's in, I think he's 94 now, back in Vietnam. Uh, it seems like he's dying, but smiling all the way through. Uh, he says that uh, we need to develop eyes to see like a poet. We should see this piece of paper like a poet, and we could see the clouds inside, inside this. So, you know, we can also apply that to our nasty little selves, our beautiful selves inside of us. How do we see them as totally within an ecosystem that help create them? And of course, you know, we'll all talk about um, our families, how they tend to be a very important part of our upbringing and who we are right now. But uh, also, you know, almost all the beautiful qualities in, inside of ourselves, I think we can oftentimes attached to a role model or someone who awoken, who awakened, awoke, awoke a kind of self that was possible to be in the world. You know? yeah. So, in fact, this term emptiness, it's not so empty, it's very full. And in fact, that's another interpretation of it, is saying that actually this emptiness is really the fullness of things. And same with these impermanence and no-self. It's the complete, ungraspable fullness, overflowing quality of life. And in fact, every morning here, uh, we chant, actually only on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we chant something called the Hymn to the Perfection of Wisdom. Ciara was here, you chanted this this morning. It, uh, it starts out, uh, she is an ever-flowing fountain of incomparable light. This being, also enshrined on the altar over here, Prajnaparamita, she is the ever-flowing fountain of incomparable light. And she is said to be the, the being that a Buddha awakens to, to become a Buddha. Right? This, this light. This light. Uh, and further, there's uh, one of my favorite lines um, by the second patriarch of the, our particular school. He says, the light of lights is neither gold, nor blue, nor red, nor yellow. It is, it is the light of lights. And so in this, we can see how we're on all the fine levels. We're constantly jockeying with these selves, right? Have, have views and objects. But really at the core, if you get down to the deep touching of life, you can, you know, I think we believe that the Buddha, he totally shed identification with objects. He became the flow and then in turn turned around to living beings. And he wasn't afraid of words and objects in order to help release people from words and objects. And there's a great quote that uh, teachings are like a raft. You use them to get across the waterway and then you discard, you discard them once you're across. Yeah, so I encourage everyone to, I don't know, you can, you can plunder that, you can explore that. Uh, it's actually closer, closer than you might think, I would say. So maybe I'll prep for the next class real quick. Um, we will be talking about the wheel of life. Have people, does anyone, can you raise your hand if you have a concept of the wheel of life? Oh, yeah, yeah, a few people, great. This is uh, one of my favorite teachings within all of Buddhism. I kind of think about it as like basic Buddhist psychology 101. Uh, the Lord of death holds up a mirror and uh, reflects to you your, your state as a being. And there are six realms in this, and the realms are the human realm, which congratulations, you're in. <laughs> you made it. It's said to be very rare and valuable. And then there's also the realm of the heavenly gods, the realm of kind of the, the fighting spirits or jealous gods, uh, the realm of the hungry ghosts, the hell realm, and then the animal realm. And uh, these guys... This impermanence and uh, no self are part of this, um, uh, you could say they're the back framing of what allows, what, uh, for living beings, they transmigrate, they move throughout these different realms, is the formal Buddhist teaching. And you know, we could think about that on um, a more literal level, that after I die, I will be reborn as another creature. Uh, I'm not so interested in talking about that. I'm not even quite settled about that on, in my own views. What I'm really sure about is that these things linked together um, on a much more immediate basis. 
So for example, you're feeling really good, you eat six pieces of people, uh, six, six pieces of people, that will probably take you straight to the hell realm, I would say. I was gonna say pizza. Um, which on the other hand, I think that'll just take you to the animal realm, right? There are certain things we do in life that engage with our energetics and our perception of the world that give you um, kind of, they, they limit your ability to see a more breadth of possibility in life. And then further, this teaching is really interesting. It, it talks about the different characteristics of the people in the realm. So for example, you're in the animal realm. You're really going to be concerned with base pleasure. <laughs> That's pretty much the world you see. You see very base desires and you're looking to satisfy those. The human realm, it's mainly uh, uh, both you're, you're engaged in practicality. And that can have uh, a great side to it because it's said in the most... Uh, uh, advantageous perception of that practicality, you learn to practice the Dharma. You decide that running around, you have some awareness that running around in these realms uh, is happening and the human realm is like not pleasurable enough that you are totally just uh, engulfed by the loveliness of life as in the heavenly God's realm and you're not uh, totally uh, devoured by pain as in the hell realms. And so you're able to have a certain kind of stability. So whereas if you, you might think that you want to become a heavenly god, right? As I think many, I don't know, YouTubers want or famous, you want to get famous and uh, be sort of disconnected from reality. But in fact, in sort of Buddhist cosmology, uh, you're so uh, ephemeral and you're so disconnected from your embodiment that uh, you, forget, you forget about that. And once your good feeling runs out, you sort of plummet back down into the lower realms. You've forgotten about your embodiment. You're living in the sky. And I think we've all, you can have these feelings. You, you win a soccer game and you're sort of high on life. You have something else really wonderful happen to you. And you sort of disconnect from all of your responsibilities that you actually need to be taken care of. So that's kind of my off-the-cuff spiel about giving you... Uh, if you, are, if you are one of the people who will be reading a little bit in the Zen Roots book, I'd say it'd be good. Um, he gets into the Wheel of Life maybe halfway through. Um, if you ended up reading about that, I think that'd be stellar, kind of prep you for the next class. And really, this is where we um, start to look at kind of, we sort of established today the, the bedrock of saying, okay, these are, um, these are kind of fundamental realities of life and sort of hinted at what it means to work with them, but we didn't sort of talk about explicit teachings. Uh, there are teachings that say, okay, with these as, as sort of the bedrock of the world, what do we do? What do we do? And so we'll talk about the Four Noble Truths and kind of the key to unlocking this and how these things aren't necessarily negative. Really, they're just kind of like gravity. And the Four Noble Truths are talking about Here's how you fall down the stairs. Here's how you walk down the stairs. And that relates to those different realms. So it's all very fun. It's all rich with imagery. I'll see if I can find, I think we might find a couple of beautiful ones and maybe blow them up and put them on a poster board. We'll see what the budget has for that. Cool. All right, that's my teaser for next class. And you have your homework to uh, see if you can Figure out an experience where you're pigeonholing your whole life towards an experience or an object and sort of bring some awareness to that. And it'd be fun to share about those if people want to. Next class. All right, any other thoughts for the good of the order? All right, so how we, how we end the class, these classes traditionally, is we'll sort of sing the refuges in Pali. So if you don't know this, uh, many, many people here do, and feel free to just follow along. And if you don't want to sing them, that's fine. So, thank you. And so uh, the words are exactly, um, well, they're saying, I take refuge in Buddha, I take refuge in Dharma, I take refuge in Sangha. Buddha. <laughs>